Today, we welcome Jo Cheel, who is a finalist in the business category of the NLP Awards. Jo, I, I'm, I'm so lucky I've been able to read all these nominations and, and yours, like all of them, is just inspirational. Um, and this, this nomination seems to be centered around the work that you've been doing with care homes um, and specifically Signature. And I just, could you tell us a bit more about that work that you've been doing with, with care homes, Signature and others? Uh, sure, thank you, yeah. Um, I'm gonna start with um, why care homes and um, it's kind of, as I've matured uh, in life, I think I've kind of got, uh, I'm in a better space to be uh, working with care homes because I kind of understand. But here's, the, here's the, the bit that not so many people know about me. For the first 10 years of my life, I grew up in, it wasn't a care home. It was at the time in the 1970s was called kind of an, an old folks home or uh, it wasn't a nursing home. It was very much a residential. But for the first 10 years of my life, I actually grew up in that environment because my mum and dad ran that business. Uh, so really, it's kind of strangely home from home, <laughs> which, is, which I love. And it's a, it's a kind of almost like a, a little bit of a nice story as well um, with when I'm running courses within care homes, rather than who is this bloke from the business world and what does he know about care homes well I kind of grew up in one so I I, I do I, I do get it I get it and so I had not my... be old enough to be living in one yet <laughs> oh, yeah no but particularly with uh, one of the companies Signature which was the, the from where the nomination came from they're such gorgeous places and I'm not meaning to plug them or you know or kind of advertise them specifically but they are kind of high top end um, and what that means is I've said to them look you know in about 20 or so years time what I'm going to be doing I'm, I want to carry on working with you I want to be uh, you know like running a course on something or the other and then instead of leaving I'm just going to find one of the empty bedrooms and stay in there <laughs> <laughs> just kind of just la 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 <laughs> um, and, and you know <laughs> well exactly I'll just carry on being the trainer you know like within within the within the Care home, the facilitator of the care home um, but it, it does fascinate me and this is really key to working with care homes is that I find talking to people you know younger folk you know people my age some people don't mind that idea of, of care home and some people are kind of almost quite terrified of that idea of, of being put and that's the phrase it used to be being put in a care home you know as if it was like no choice no option so I really I know that there are some fantastic ones and I know there are some troubled ones as well out there in the world. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's a, I kind of, it's like living in a sort of hotel or guest house almost idea. I, I, I love that. And, and for me, that, that does capture the spirit of what I look for when I'm working with care homes. Because I work with it now, sort of it, it's built, I've worked with a range of different uh, care home companies. Um, and I, you know, there's the space itself, the place itself, the feeling when you go in, um, but also there's the the staff themselves and how the friendliness and you know it's meant to be the care industry. And the other thing in terms of context set, albeit that this is now this is after the nomination happened, this year 2020 has just been obviously an extraordinary year but for the care industry, for the care homes. And, and I've seen it from now more and more from the inside and what it does, these people that, you know, on the whole are genuinely, they are in it because of the empathy levels that they have, the care that they have to look after, you know, other people's parents and grandparents. Yeah. And this has been a tough time, not only for, and for the residents and for the families as well, but it's, it's just the original, um, the uh, nomination was about resilience, yeah. uh, resilience, and, and particularly partly around a project um, of uh, resilience through bereavements as well, which is obviously a key thing uh, in care homes too, for the staff, for the families, for the other residents, um, and how do the staff cope with that? Um, but of course, this this year has just been, has, you know, it doesn't resilience. You can you can be resilient. But there will, you know, resilience still implies almost that there, there, there may be a, either a breaking point somewhere. You know, if you think about the resilience of, uh, of metal or something, you know, that, that you can kind of keep bending it around. Oh, that's resilient. But it, it will it will snap. There's a, another metaphor that's used, which is a sponge, which I think is a softer metaphor, yeah. uh, which is when the sponge is full, yeah. that you can't 
I can, you know, it, resilience is like how spongy are you? <laughs> yeah, how, much, how much can you absorb? But there will come a point where it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I need ringing out. Yeah. So um, you've been so, able to keep working with, with the care home throughout. Yes. Yeah, so um, in a slightly different capacity, yes. of, obviously. So because they couldn't have, particularly earlier in lockdown, they couldn't have strangers, you know, coming in. Uh, you know, the families weren't allowed in. So why would a consultant be allowed in? And actually, as soon as the, you know, the lockdown happened, I don't want to make this all about lockdown, but it, it's relevant. You know, it's very relevant. Um, about a week before, I'd been working with Signature in, in a uh, one of their care homes in London. Um, and so I'd been on the train and, you know, packed train, and there'd been more and more talk of this virus. And I was thinking this is getting silly because, you know, we didn't know much about what it was to get it at that particular time and the long effects of it. However, I was thinking, hey, I don't want it. I don't want to get this flu thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan. Yeah. Um, but what if I get it, but those, you know, that contagious time, or I don't know I've got it. And then I'm taking it into care home, to care home, to care home. And I'm the spreader. And I thought, I can't, I can't, do that so we we kind of closed our doors about a week before the government did yeah. um and and obviously then the care homes did. so we've been in particularly with signature been in kind of constant support mode with uh, with them i i said to any of the care home managers the general managers if they got to a you know a breaking point or a, wanted to let off steam or or were facing any issues or whatever that i I'd, I'd be there you know just pro bono because um, it was, yeah, I just, I did my, every single time in the news, there was more about care homes and, you know, less support from the government. It was like, ah, uh, and I know they're doing their thing and, you know, not meaning to be political with that, but it's like, well, the support has to come from somewhere. So I, you know, I had a few phone calls with people and uh, Zooms with people, but what was then happening towards the tail end and maybe when we get to about i don't know october ish september october there was a couple of the other couple of in fact three different care homes companies just said we're going to ppe you up <laughs> but we want you to come in so it was like Brilliant. In a dark <laughs> red, a mask you know <laughs> it was yeah. me marigolds yeah <laughs> I've made friends with Marigold uh, over this whole pandemic thing. Uh, go to go to the supermarket, put, put them on Marigolds. Uh, I might continue doing that. Who knows? Uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So I, you know, I have had the opportunity to be in the room with with people. But the other thing, and again, this is all linked to resilience. As and I know we're not the only ones that did it, but as a training company. Um, and uh, also obviously Melody with her, with her side of the NLP training company too. We just got straight on with Zoom and, and just made it work. And and what you see right now is is my training room, uh, is the flip, you know, I wanted to keep keep the flip chart. And again, that means what's that got to do with the nomination, but it's about the adaptation, yeah. but keeping what was good about training from my perspective was the live elements of it, the interactive live element. So we've done everything that we possibly can to, I, I kind of changed it. So you're not looking at a screen, you're looking through a window into the Imaginarium. Yeah. Um, and then it was like, I started to get feedback from people saying, oh, that was really weird. It was like I was in the room with you. Yeah. That highest praise from my perspective, as a, for just purely from a training perspective. Um, but it was the adaptation of how can we keep the best of the past, but bring that into the new, into this kind of new environment. And I think we'll be doing the same again of how can we keep the best from this time and yeah. take that into the new world as we step blinking into the sun. Um, and, and I think Zoom, I, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, yes, this is true. Uh, but I've kind of just got to really enjoy this and mm -hmm. it's not it's not quite the same of course it's not as being in the room with people um, however you know it's it's a second best and oh, it's yeah there are advantages and I think I think you're right you know that that genie is never going to go back in the bottle and we've we've said that so it's it's about adaptation and and exactly what you said taking the best and carrying that forward and in yes. certainly, I mean, reading reading the, the your nomination or the, the nomination made by Signature um, brought tears to my eyes. So I will I will manage my state and just read <laughs> some of what they wrote. 
Uh, Joe genuinely cares about our service, our people and our residents. I always feel that we matter to Joe on a personal level. He has always been willing to provide us with informal advice and one-to-one -one support, which has been invaluable. All of this adds up to a consultant who always goes above and beyond and who we are keen to continue working with. And I think, you know, you, you've just said you, that the additional work that you've been doing throughout lockdown and everything summarises exactly what, what was written in this nomination. Um, so how, do you, how does that make you feel when you hear something like that about you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, I love it. It's, it's um, because it's what... I in, in, it's, it's, it's what I endeavour to do. It's like, okay, as a consultant, there's like, you know, okay, you, you come and you do your course and get paid for the day. And I've always wanted to, you know, we, we and this is going to sound really technical, but we've never charged for, for um, preparation, you know, to put a course together unless it was, you know, had to interview staff and things like that. So it was, um, it's always been, this is, this is what we do. This is, this is what you pay for, if, you know, that day. However, these are the other things. And it's, it's like, and it's particularly... I mean, I've always done this, but it's particularly, I think it's appreciated in some arenas and some less so. Some arenas, you know, more commercial, it's just like, oh, good, thank you very much. Indeed, yes, we'll take whatever you can give us. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Whereas with the games, it genuinely feels like, wow, this person does seem to actually care. And when I, I just love it. There's something weird for me when I go into one of the care homes, and if I kind of when I say bump into I don't mean physically but I'm in the corridor if there's one of the residents in there I always I just love you know the kind of saying hello and if there's a conversation to be had sometimes there's not they're kind of you know on the Zimmer friend and they're trundling from A to B and there's no one's going to stop them as it were but you know there are some and you know you can't quite see it here but um, I've got I wear a pocket watch and I think for them again sometimes waistcoat and stuff so again I think there's a sort of a curiosity factor for people as <laughs> to um Oh, that's a nice, have oh, you got a pocket watch? Oh, that's a nice pocket watch. And it's just anything to connect and make those connections. But I, the, the other thing I like to do when I'm working um, within a home, if I'm running a training course in one of their rooms, is I kind of, well, not imagine, but I just act like I'm one of the care team. Right. So I'm, you know, rather than feeling like a stranger. So, you know, if there happen to be, you know, I, not that there would be, but if there was a sweet wrapper on the floor, I'd pick it up, uh, you know, and maybe that's a really obvious thing to say, or if there's something, if I go into, into the loose and there's something kind of like the tap's been, you know, or there's something, something it's like, I'll, I'll just fix sort it out. You know, I don't mean fix it as in a plumber. I mean, <laughs> wow. I'll, yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> no, not, not my skills don't go that, uh, that direction. <laughs> um, but yes, it's, it's, and I think that I've always felt like whichever organization I work for, I represent their learning and development team or the HR team. I, I actually represent that. I rep the reputation of the HR team within an organization as well, because if someone doesn't like what I do for some crazy reason, um, then that reflects on, on the HR department. So, well, why did you get that person in? So I take, I, I do take that very seriously and take that as be working as part of a team very collaborative in that sense um but yeah it is it is it is lovely to um to hear and read that um something along those lines because it's just like uh, to be to be acknowledged for the stuff i like to do i like that stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely lovely i mean there's, there's another couple of things i just i, I think everybody could pick up on this We've noticed a tangible buzz in the office and in the care homes after Joe's training, and hence he has helped raise the profile of learning and development in the company, um, which is what you've just alluded to. And also, but I also think one of the really key things, which, which of course we know as, as NLP professionals, three months after the events, one of the care home managers reported, and this was significant to us, the changes that I have noticed since the training is that the staff are more comfortable addressing end of life plans with both residents and family. Yeah. And that's so important that actually what you have done has had a lasting effect. Yes, actually, do you know what, of, of all of 
what was written you know it's nice to hear lovely things about um, you know, about me and and I love the idea of people being very buzzy afterwards because again that's that's what I endeavor to do is is like generate a buzz to 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 then um you know if I have the opportunity to walk to help with the after training you know to to help embed it that's great but there's not always that opportunity and so within that home in particular it was one of those lovely pieces of feedback that wasn't just the kind of straight after the course going yes it was a very lovely course thank you very much indeed and and one of, by the way from that project that we did you know that with and it was with one particular care home in a previous with a previous company i was working with the people in the room were arranged they weren't just all they weren't all managers they were you know staff from the kitchen staff from you know the um tidying up you know they, 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 it was yeah. there. and um the care home manager was in one of the sessions and she said afterwards that's uh, that's amazing you had a couple of people in the room talking and telling their stories and giving examples and they never say anything oh. so it was like okay that's cool yeah. um so i love that as well but the this fact that someone had a space and they and they actually spoke up, and I, I love that. Yeah. But but to hear something that three months later, yeah. and particularly because the whole course was around the nature of bereavement, yes. But it was. I, here's the thing that I learned, and it, I should have known it already. But here was the thing that I learned: coping with bereavement is one thing, and it, and it's tough because it's a loss, and it can be um, for for the staff. Sometimes they may have a, a very dear um, resident who they almost project to that nature of sort of grandparents or parents and so it is for them it's like losing you know on some level it is like losing a grandparent yeah. uh, and, and so for the staff themselves they they may be feeling it now some have kind of grown to get used to that over a period of time and they've worked in the industry for a long time but there's you know some of them are younger and it's like oh and they're, they're in tears and but of course, it's, it's not at that. Then they've got to deal with like the other other residents who may be like, oh, what's happened to you know, whoever, George or whatever. And, and then they've got to kind of explain that. And then the families, of course, and the range of experiences of like some some families will be kind of like, you know, very quiet and in tears or some will be angry, you know, almost accusational as well. And so it's like somebody who's experiencing their own grief about the loss of the resident because it's a kind of grandparent figure, a lovely person, and then dealing with a family who are very angry and it gets directed at them. It's just a whole, the whole gamut of emotions of possibilities there that they're having to deal with, um, which, 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 was, which is phenomenal. But to hear the, uh, that, that aspect of the, uh, the you know, kind of end of life care, that was the bit, oh my goodness, you're dealing with somebody who is, Head, you know he's, he's heading in that direction so and that's the challenge of that the emotional roller coaster not just we talk about bereavement that's that's when the emotional roller coaster starts yeah. it's not of course it's not and i know that's you know if, if anybody loses somebody there's always there's often a lead up to that an illness for example sometimes people just go you know my dad just went he just kind of left the building as it were um but the, but I was, that was the other thing i was going to say was that some families actually use humor yeah. So it's because family comes in and then all the staff suddenly go, oh, oh you must go get a I'm terribly sorry to hear about it. And, and they're kind of like, there's a mismatch then, but you don't know. You can't yeah. know until the family kind of comes in and the way they behave. Um, and, and that was very much true when we lost um, my dad um, was my brother and I have a very kind of, not I can't be unique, but it is to us a kind of unique sense of humour and some of the, the laughter and stuff we were just in we were in hysterics half the time but in a in laughter and my mum was even joining in with that and she sometimes talks about well, that was the loveliest time <laughs> <laughs> but not because dad had passed away but because she had her two sons and we were all laughing together and, yeah. and chatting and stuff yeah. um, so this it's such a weird thing but no the end of life thing that was the bit that kind of really I thought oh my god within the care home they're having to deal with that relentlessly mm. uh, and and so it's it's helping somebody to go um, yeah. and that that's the bit so hearing that bit that it was people are actually feeling more comfortable to address that end of life bit it's not it's not something we unless you're in the care industry or the the you know in the, the nhs or the or the um it's just not a conversation yeah. we have to have with people yeah. it, it's such an, an, an unusual conversation to have to have with people so I'm, i was really pleased 
with just that little nugget that three yeah. months later she had observed that people were more comfortable having those conversations it was like yes yeah um, sure. so i hadn't been able to go back in it wasn't it wasn't kind of keep coming back in it was yeah. it was a you know that was that was a half day uh, session um but it was enough i think to have i think have almost all of the staff you know through yeah uh, through the day um on that session uh, so that was that was uh, that is very rewarding Tr training as you know is hard to measure sometimes it's hard to get the return on investment that we all want particularly with the soft skills uh, but so to hear that that's that's kind of worth its weight in gold <laughs> absolutely, absolutely so what does it mean for you joe to be nominated for this award oh man um this okay uh, you know obviously there's there's a little bit of the ego thing it's like oh, that's you know that's nice and oh, not me oh no don't you know seriously so i acknowledge that side of myself you know that kind of the ego so i love the idea of being an acknowledgement of of what i do now i have i've been doing this kind of stuff it's fascinating me i've been doing this kind of thing for 27 28 years now and so I guess it's it is nice, you know. Of course, it's nice to have that somebody go, you you've done a good job, son. You know, it's that is a, an, a it is an acknowledgement. I think weirdly, unless you are into all the kind of like all accolades and and going to many many awards and and all this kind of stuff, it can be a sort of quite a lonely experience as a as a, a trainer, unless you're part of a bigger training company. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm lucky that I've got Melody. You know, she's got she was NLP, and then I've got Imaginarium. So we both understand how it is and at the end of the day we can kind of go what was that like but it can be quite a lonely experience and sometimes not getting feedback or thinking i you know that that felt like a good day that felt like a good job so it's, it is lovely to, to actually get something more contained and more formal uh, mm. in that so there is a there is a of course a um yeah it, it's, uh, it's difficult to pinpoint the specific emotion uh, i think it's a kind of a range of emotions um that yeah there you go <laughs> i got it it's, it's i think that's summed up <laughs> i'm just staring into space that's what i call beyond words now there you go how do i feel beyond words there we go that's probably <laughs> which you did in every sense <laughs> so who or maybe what it could be either inspired you ha has inspired you continues to inspire you in your nlp journey oh well that actually that's a real I, on one again multi-leveled answer to that one which could take all day but i think if i bring it back to resilience specifically i think nlp is is absolutely perfect as as a as a field as a even if you want to just take it as a set of tools um i think it is perfect for the nature of resilience, that those things that have been discovered within NLP so far, um, I, I think are just give people a different angle to, if, if somebody's wanted, if, I know being silly, if someone says, I, I, I wanna feel more resilient, I wanna feel more confident, let's say, and you end up asking them questions that no one else will ask them. So it's like, okay, well, you know, uh, if, if, if confidence had a color, what would it be? Yeah. Uh, you know, or uh, if, if it had a sound or if it had a, so we kind of go into, into that. And that's just one little area of, of NLP. But I love that because to ask someone a question that they've not been asked before or not considered before, uh, and they're prepared to play. Um, I mean, as I said, that's just a sorry, a very minute um, example, but the nature of modeling in and of itself. And that that's the bit that I know uh, Michael Hall many years ago, that was his kind of um, where he got gained his acclaim and awards many years ago within NLP with Metastates. But so that's interesting. But I actually think take people who are resilient and then what is it about them that's different to people that seem less resilient? Yeah. And we talk about the bounce back factor um, and, and kind of, which is great as a metaphor, but it's like it still doesn't tell us what to yeah, do. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll bounce back. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but the, I mean, if I give you one thing that, of kind of modeling people that are resilient that seem to bounce back more effectively and, and um, efficiently they get and this is going to sound really obvious but they get outcome focused very quickly yeah so they shift from problem state to from that 
why me? Or, you know, oh, all those people, or the government, or, you know, that thing happening to me again. And blah, 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 blah. they get out of that very quickly. And they almost sometimes don't even seem to enter it particularly because they're just, they're just like, right, where am I headed? What am I trying to achieve here? And they just get boom, back into, into that space. Yeah. Um, and I like that. That is something I can share with people in a business course. It, yeah. I, you know, I, it's often rather than the NLP specific tools, techniques, language, jargon, it's the modeling aspect of what have I observed in these people over here that seem to be very successful and what can I then share with these people over here that makes sense to them that they can kind of go, oh yeah, I can do that. That's cool. So, you know, what questions should I be asking? And, you know, if we're having a meeting, then what can, what questions can we ask to move the conversation on and things? And, and so and I, I think for me... Yeah. Sorry, sorry, no, it's interrupting you. <laughs> well, no, I was going to say, for me, that's what I find exciting about the combination of NLP and business yeah. is it's, there's always something new um, that may seem really obvious. It may just be a small little piece of something, um, you know, and again, one of the things that's thrown people during this time has been uh, because of working from home. That's been a whole new thing mm -hmm. for many people and just something like prioritizing. And it, it's something that, I mean, I wrote a book a few years ago, who stole my pie about time, prioritizing, managing, you know, but it was just something that having a, a, a course that I ran just recently, and it was a lot of talk about the very reactive environment that they're in. And it was, of course, and it was like, you know, suddenly there was like this bolt in my head of like, oh, of course, this prioritizing proactively when you know what it is you need to do. You've got a to-do list and you think, hmm, which of these do I need to do first? And it's kind of organized. Mm -hmm. But then there's reactive prioritization, which is so true in a care home when they're in the middle of doing one thing. And then suddenly it's like, oh, so and Mrs. So-and-so's. Um, you know, needs you, or someone's fallen over, or there's a, a leak in the, you know, coming through the ceiling, or this, and it's like they're getting pulled in very different directions. There's yeah. no to-do list. What is that? How do they prioritise that? And it was, and I know that sounds really obvious, but it's like there are two very distinct forms of prioritisation, which yeah. I haven't seen any book on. Maybe it's out there. I'm sure it's out there. Somebody will have thought of it already, but it's two very distinct. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, it'll be in a book somewhere. Of course, it will be next year. Uh, but just, just things like that. Where it's just like, why didn't I think of that? Why wasn't that apparent to me earlier on? And now it's like, okay, strategies which we've got for organizing your to do list, you know? And then it's like, oh, strategies for organizing when you're not organized, when there is no organizing, it's just stuff coming at you. Those are two very distinct categories yeah. now in my mind, whereas before it was all just about prioritizing. Yeah. But, so that's, more, that's just simply an example. It's a link to resilience, of course it is, uh, but it's, it's about. How do, how do I take what people give me and the questions they have and the challenges? My favorite phrase is, well, that doesn't work or that I can't see how I'm going to make that work. That's one of my favorite phrases that people come back with. It's like, ooh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I know one of the things that Richard Bandler said was the, uh, the most, for him, the where he's learned the most, the most interesting clients are those where it doesn't work first time around. Yeah. Like, it doesn't work. It's not working. Cool. <laughs> yeah. what do we do now? Exactly. and that is resilience yeah <laughs> and, and in the business world especially you know you talk about models and in the business world they are so open to models aren't they um that they yeah. don't have the same requirements as possibly the, the health sector has in terms of double blind trials and, and randomized controlled trials and that sort of thing that they have a very different set of criteria that they're working to and, and modeling and yeah. models and you know even the basic communication model they just slip so easily into a corporate business environment and yes. get absorbed and, and worked as you yeah. demonstrated yeah and here's the other key part of it the model is if, if it's modeled on modeled on what people do and and the way they process information and stuff it's it's a pragmatic model it's a practical model because it's not just a theoretical yeah. academic thing because the important bit then is what can i do with this yeah what can I, and so that that is always the credo i have I, I when i was doing my master's degree um there's a book by charles handy and he talks about the kind of the manager within the organization that goes well yeah all these theories are all very well but what can i do with them and it was like yes that is the manager i'm working for yeah. <laughs> the models are great but you need to be able to actively do something or do something different as a result of that um, yeah. so which is why i like that kind of more pragmatic approach to modeling of like these people are here what are they doing what's going through their mind how are they dealing with that how are they framing things 
Um, and then it's like, okay, that's the model then, what do we do with that? Yeah. Uh, but you're right, I think we, we love models because it just for a moment in time, it brings not necessarily simplicity, but it just brings structure out of chaos yeah. and complexity. We have a structure for a moment in time that we can just, oh yeah, that's yeah. kind of the yeah. three different key areas and all the four quadrant, you know, the kind of things and like, oh yes, this is very good. But now what are we going to do with it? Yeah, okay, yeah. now back to what we can do. But yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think that for me, rather than, you know, where it's kind of great in a therapeutic environment of uh, the, uh, you know, fast phobia cure and, and even things like Swish, I don't tend to use that maybe wrongly. I don't know, but I don't tend to use that in organizations. I take the kind of the, the more, the, the kind of origins of NLP as, as a modeling process and, and use that to generate um, new ideas and, to present different things to different people and that's what excites me I'm, a, I'm an ideas person um I'm, I'm kind of more the uh the innovator i was i was looking um, at uh, malcolm gladwell and i can't remember his specific terms so forgive me but he basically talks about three different types um which we can be a bit of everything but you've got the ideas people that kind of they they're collectors they yeah. kind of go oh, this is good and they see patterns and stuff they go oh, i've got a new model i've got a new thing here's my product you know this is like this groovy thing inventors um, then you've got the connectors who are the people that kind of go, I know someone who might, you know, who might benefit from that, or I know somebody who you could talk to with, and they're great at kind of connecting, networking. Yeah. And then you've got the convincers who are the people who, and that's not his terminology, that's, that's mine, who are then able to sell it. Um, and so, you know, I'm, my predominance is the, in the ideas realm, uh, which is fine and modeling, etc. cetera. Um, the, the bit that I, I forget to do because I get so caught up in the excitement of like, oh, new idea, whoa, is, the, um, is sometimes the actually reaching out. I, I, most recent, I talk about all my books, my most recent book, which is again about resilience at the level of career, your career uh, and, live, and goals, which is driving your destiny. Mm. Um, and, you know, I put that out on LinkedIn once as if like, there we go. I've told the world yeah. that's good enough. <laughs> people should now buy the book because, you know, it's like it's, I've told people once some time ago. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like you think I really should probably just put something else out there. You know, at some point. I don't just... think I've heard of this book, Joe. <laughs> I wasn't on LinkedIn. I don't go on LinkedIn at all, but I wasn't on LinkedIn at that precise moment. <laughs> on that one day, on that, that half an hour that it was live, you know. And... <laughs> uh, yes. So, so yeah, you know, I, so I have to kind of go, okay, well, look, this is my thing. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, I, I love, I love writing books as to whether they sell or not is another yeah. matter. Uh, but the models are there. They're all kind of captured in time, yeah. uh, ready, ready for the new, for the next lot of models and ideas. Yeah. So where would you like to see NLP in the future? Where would I like to see NLP in the future? I would like to see um, the, 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 the thing I always come to is that term NLP and how, because of the history, there's that challenge sometimes. There's an immediate switch on or switch off for some people. And then some people, it's like a word, what is this? And they go, it's neuro-linguistic programming. They go, it's what? Uh, so there's almost like the kind of that immediate, uh, however, where I would, what I would like to see NLP, even if it, because I'm in the business world, so therefore I would like to see it continuing, even if it takes on a new, uh, shape in some way uh, but the but the concepts are still there and still reference back to the NLP I mean we've even we've even kind of call it more and more calling it neurolinguistic psychology um, and I know you could you know if you've got to go but that's not what it should be called well you know it's keeping up with the times as well that we know you know the kind of the nature of programming etc was very sexy in the early 1970s and through the 70s with the new advent of computers but now programming on a psychological level has a, has different connotations so there's a so i that's this is sort of answering the question but where i would like to see it in the future is the concepts that that the children can be taught about how to model other people how to model other kids that are good at stuff wouldn't that have been great at school i'm just i'm just now thinking you know at school wouldn't that have been fantastic to actually the kids that were really bright well, some of them were bright. They had an IQ level up there. But actually, I know there were a couple of them that just really got curious about things. They got really fascinated by the topic. And so they would enjoy reading more about it. Yeah. You know, and, and it would almost be play for them, you know, that, that it would almost be a, become a form of play. Well, if some of those things have become a form of play for me, then I, I might have learned more, you know. But, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> but if we bring it back to the business world, it's like, 
you know, even if people learn, wow, that person over there is really good at that. Yeah. Now, give me a sort of a structure or a set of questions or something that I can easily use and easily access that allows me to emulate some of that or at least advance or, or speed up my learning process as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and other organizations, you know, I, I'm working with an, or, with, a, with an organization at the moment and it's, um, I, I, I won't say who that is because it's not in the care world, but you know, they are looking at, this isn't working, that's not working. And my thought is, well, you've got neighboring organizations that are doing, that are the same as you, you know, doing very similar things. What are they doing? Are they all sitting in a room somewhere going, we, we've got a problem with this, we've got a problem with that, or are they sitting there with different problems? So it's that ability then to kind of go over to these people, but to ask the ask sensible questions to get you to where you want to be rather than just like, oh, you're so lucky. Uh, you seem to have figured it all out. Well, that's not helpful. <laughs> it's not resilient. That's still stuck in kind of problem remedy states. It's more about, okay, what are these people doing? How are they doing it? You know, what are they prepared to share with us, et cetera? So that's how I would like to see NLP taken forward. If it's still called NLP, brilliant. If it's still called neurolinguistic psychology, or if it becomes back to modeling, um, then, then, then great. As long as the roots, what's written about it, still has its roots within the origins of NLP and the original, uh, you know, the research that people have done um, and the ideas that people had, rather than it being disconnected from yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, so that just becomes this new theory over here, like, oh, we've got this marvellous new new yeah. concept. And it's like, that's, but that's just NLP. So you're not referencing the people that actually came up with it 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So that's my hope for NLP, is that even if it's not called NLP everywhere, that the um, the origins are still referred to and, and acknowledged uh, rather than lost. Um, I think that's that would probably, in the business world, that would be my... Well, and, there's, and and I think taking that, that there's many other worlds where um, at the moment a bit of modelling wouldn't go amiss. Um, it, it, we're not talking politics, so we won't go there. <laughs> well, I bet with the education system as well and all sorts of things. A, a good bit of modelling never never does anybody any harm, does it? <laughs> oh dear. So I mean, thank you, Joe. It's been it, it's been inspirational um, speaking with you. Um, hearing much more, putting so much more depth around the nomination that um, that you were that you were given for the business sector, and um, I, I can definitely understand why now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank you for your contribution to the field of NLP because um, it's it's just so lovely to hear that rippling effect and, and what's going on and the impact that you're making in the care home world and beyond. Yeah. Thank and we'll continue, continue to do so even when I'm living in one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really good goal to have. <laughs>